live from the Oracle Conference Center in Redwood Shores, California. It's The Cube at the Next Generation Engineered Systems launch event. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Oracle. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier, with my co-host Dave Vellante. We're excited to have uh, industry analyst, luminary Matt Eastwood, Group Vice President, General Manager of IDC, Enterprise Platform Groups, and friend of theCUBE. Welcome back to theCUBE. Great Thank to John. see you. It's good to be here. So we have all the analysts at the table here. Let's, let's do a breakdown on what's Oracle's going on here. I mean, obviously, it's a launch, it's very intimate. Um, Larry's the master of the long game, as John Fowler says. This is one leg of his, of his, of his uh, sailing race that he's doing in the computing business. Um, kind of telegraphing, but specifically targeted. A lot of, a lot of, no mention of VCE, but it smells like a little VCE. It's got compute. What's your take on this? What's going on in this announcement? What, what is Oracle up to? Well, I mean, Oracle's five years into this journey now of, uh, you know, since they've acquired Sun and bringing the kind of a full system stack to the, uh, to the, uh, the equation in terms of how they think of engineering. So they're thinking of, thinking of engineering from way down in the subsystem level all the way up through the application. Uh, they're looking at all the same forces that everybody else is, you know, the impact of mobile, the impact of cloud, and, uh, and analytics, of course, on, on the marketplace and the opportunities that that presents to their customers. Uh, you know, IDC looks at this through that you know, third platform lens, so we tend to look at more traditional uh, established environments as being second platform and these emerging uh, market opportunities really being around third platform and for an Oracle it's it's really about building product that can serve both parts of that market but you know kind of serving the needs of uh, enterprises that are looking to get more efficient and automate that second platform world while they transition investment into third platform applications. Dave, third platform sounds like uh, a, little, a lot of EMC talk there. I mean, that's the, you know. EMC seems, stole it from IDC. You know, it's like, you know, <laughs> you guys pushed that on EMC. That's, that's I mean, that, that's the first I've heard of it in, in a vendor. EMC wrapped their entire strategy around that. Um, Oracle, smells a lot like Amazon in the way with the integrated stack here. What you're seeing is a platform. They're not just going after storage, they've kind of done that. Uh, so Dave, what's your take? I mean, you guys are the analysts. I mean, horses on the track. I mean, this thing have legs or? What? Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know where I stand on the Sun acquisition. I, and at first I was like everybody else, kind of scratching my head, what are they going to do? Because it's been off. And then started to see the strategy. And I wonder, Matt, what your take is on this. I mean, because you talk to a lot more of the same people that I talk to, but you must have had a year full from Oracle's competitors about what a bad move this was. And, and, and I've had many, many you know, debates, arguments, whatever, and it, it seems like it's working out pretty well. What's, what's your take on the time? I mean, again, I was sort of skeptical at the time five years ago, but now that it's progressed, it, to me anyway, it's coming more into focus. Do you agree with that? Or? Uh, I do, I think you know, Oracle's really uh, as, as good as anybody in the industry when it comes to um, acquisitions and absorbing those acquisitions. And it didn't take all that much time for, for uh, Oracle to uh, create a situation where Sun was uh, uh, margin neutral to the company. And a lot of people thought they wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, they, they brought it back to pre-acquisition margins in a pretty short time frame. And, and I think where Oracle was really ahead of the market is when you think about uh, engineered systems, or we, we call them integrated systems at IDC, uh, the initial phase was really kind of on packaging. But where we're heading now is really deep architectural uh, you know, considerations around the hardware and software stack and really kind of software defined, if you will, environment. And that's really the vision that Oracle had from the beginning. So they really set out to, to build engineered systems from, from the base level you know, uh, componentry all the way up to the system level services. And that was their vision five years ago. And I think they were really ahead of the market at the time. So, I mean, you look at what's happened. So Cisco's another one. They come into the marketplace. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I was skeptical about Cisco. And I think in, in general, I was wrong about Cisco. And so they've had some, some pretty good success. <coughs> you're seeing you know, you're, uh, Oracle with success. IBM exits the x86 right, right. business. It's almost as though you know, Oracle's x86 strategy is exactly what you know, companies like IBM wished they had. In other words, we keep focusing on the profitable side of the business. So what do you see in the systems landscape? It, it seems like there's a systems renaissance going on and then the, the storage and the systems pieces coming together. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, with the industry spent the last few years, if you think about the comment I made about you know, first phase being around packaging, mm. the first phase of this was really acquiring the pieces that you needed to service kind of a fully integrated 
stack. So you had to have compute, you had to have network, or, and you had to have uh, storage, and had at least had to have access to uh, good, deep uh, engineering partnerships around that. And so Cisco, uh, they recognized, I think what really changed on the infrastructure side in the data center was really the uh, advent of virtualization. So as virtualization gained steam over the last 10 years, it really shifted how uh, architects and CTOs thought of the data center and they really wanted to create a, a virtual pool of resource and they recognized that uh, anything that happened on the server side had impact on the storage <coughs> side and on the network side. So that was really where Cisco came out and, and started to differentiate. Um, Oracle's really differentiated specifically in the, in the, in the stack around, around data, particularly with uh, Exadata and, and with Exologic and now with things like Exolytics. They've been very focused on looking at very specific Workloads that could be, um, you know, uh, you know, engin engineered in a way that they had incredible performance characteristics, and so the focus was really on these workloads that had unique characteristics. So, so what do you see as? I mean, in, in your mind, is this integrated systems, engineered systems, converged infrastructure? What are you going to call it? Is it, <coughs> is it evolutionary? Is it becoming more radical and, and revolutionary, particularly from a customer standpoint and an economics perspective? It's a good question. I think um, you know they're really today are, if you look competitively at the landscape, kind of three uh, types of um, integrated or converged infrastructures. You have the, the core infrastructure uh, that, that's you know, where Cisco's been playing with its partners with NetApp and EMC. Then you have uh, Oracle, who's really been the leader on the platform side, kind of taking that further up the stack. And then you have the, the really the, the world of the startups that has really emerged kind of around hyper-converged and, and kind of fabric-based mm -hmm. uh, computing that's happening kind of at the edge. And so all three of those served somewhat different constituents and different workloads in the marketplace and the decision makers are a bit different as well. So Oracle's very f been very focused on having the most success on, on applications or workloads where performance really, really matters. And the decision makers around those, those engineered systems tend to be people that Oracle has an awful lot of influence with. So think of database administrators. Application and heads. Like exactly. But the, the, the messaging we're going to hear today is, is also on cost. Like you, we're going to be the low cost <laughs> supplier, we're going to be cheaper. Uh, do you buy it? Well, when you look at, the, the interesting thing about integrated or converged is wherever there's a winner, there's a loser. And so this is really a, largely a share of wallet play. And so if you're winning, you're, you're able to win at a nice margin, but, but at somebody else's expense. And so this is, you know, if you think about it at, at, at a high level, it's about selling uh, higher utilizations. So higher utilizations on the storage, on the compute, on the network side. It's about selling um, better availability to the marketplace. Uh, it, so overall, it has a, both a, a capex and an opex attractiveness. They're high margin systems, they're high value systems, but if you, if you do it right, you can spend less in total, both on the opex and on the capex so side. So you basically call them, it's this sort of zero sum game. So you got the horses on the track, there's HP, there's IBM, there's Dell, there's uh, EMC now taking back VCE, there's Cisco and, and NetApp, obviously Oracle, I, I guess Hitachi plays here as, as well. Um, if it is a zero sum game, uh, who wins? Um, so right now, if, you, if, if I were to break that, those three pieces apart, the infrastructure, the, uh, the platform, and the, and the hyperconverged, so Oracle's the leader in what we would call uh, integrated platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, all, the all the way up the stack. All the way up the stack. Clearly. They're, yeah. they're, and the, you know, they're number, the, number, the biggest competitors that they face there are IBM and uh, Teradata. So competitors that they know well, but where Oracle's really paid a lot of attention to, uh, to out innovating and moving a bit faster. Uh, IBM will feel some of the impacts from what they did with their divestiture of, of their System X business because a lot of the building blocks for pure app and pure data were in that x86 infrastructure. So, so they're now more dependent on Lenovo as a partner, as an OEM partner for that for that those layers. So it'll be interesting to see what mm -hmm. IBM and it maybe opens does. up some other partnerships too. Certainly, and, and IBM gotten has gotten closer with Cisco recently. So, so Matt, how do you <coughs> um, add into the Amazon equation? Because obviously we saw that at reInvent, huge enterprise focus. You mentioned IBM, Teradata, usual suspects. We know Larian has a love love affair with IBM in terms of being the competitive. You know, IBM, IBM. Everyone else is kind of like, ah, whatever. IBM's a real target for the, on their back. Get that. Outside of IBM and Teradata, who else is out there? And where does Amazon fit in? Because Amazon approach, although not close to Oracle at this point. I mean, Andy Jassy, his team, they went integrated. They went from going from just storage or just compute to fully integrated from the beginning. Are they on a collision course, completely different? Obviously, Oracle's huge in terms of the workloads. Uh, and 
Uh, yeah, and I think you know to Dave's question earlier, really what's happening here is the the, the control point or the, or the the overall value point moves higher up the stack, you know, higher up in the software. And so Oracle uh, has an advantage there in that they have this this robust high value stack that they uh, make a lot of money on with with good margin. What happens down below is is quite interesting when you look at the competitive landscape uh, from from a systems provider perspective. Is when I say the market goes from kind of a packaging exercise to a deep architectural exercise, what that's also saying is that those, the fundamental layers in the in the compute stack, commodity is not a term I really like, but they begin to homo homogenize, and the value moves up into the software layer, and so that's really where the cloud players like Amazon are spending a lot of their time is in creating innovation in that software layer, and they're working with companies like Intel, as is Oracle, to to really create a more innovative hardware layer that's optimized for their stack, and that creates their competitive advantage. Yeah, I mean, Amazon's, I mean, they're not even touching open compute, we see them kind of like just watching it, doing their own thing. Um, let's talk about the, the cloud, obviously. Do you think there'll be a second class citizen tiering of the cloud, or one tier one, tier two? I mean, if you look at what Oracle's doing, we just had IBM System Z announcement, um, really impressive, high performance, monolithic-like systems, but yet versatile, right? So, right, right. high performance, you know, fully converged, um, that potentially could torch this whole blue mix, cloud foundry, you got HP, IBM, and others trying to be Amazon, and then on one hand, and then you got, you know, trying to win the developer community, then you got Oracle and IBM over here, could torch the <coughs> field on that. Do you see that risky, this whole, this whole middle layer battle, or just a tier two? Well, there, I mean, there, there's very much this, uh, you know, kind of build versus buy analysis happening in the marketplace. And so if you look at the Amazons and all the hyperscalers, they've been building their own. If you look at enterprise, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense. They don't have the scale to, to really consider building their own in most places. Um, they're focusing on how do they innovate more in apps and more in data and how those applications are changing. They're becoming more about uh, mobile enablement. They're becoming more about real-time analytics and informing real-time business decisions. So you have to use a, kind of a traditional model in the market, the industry's thought of systems of record as a long time, that back end, that's where yeah. really System Z, uh, the world of System Z, the world of, of big uh, Unix. And of course, for the last 20 HCM years. HCM and ERP, same thing. Sure, sure, and for the last you know, 20 years or so, we've been dealing with systems of, of engagement. How do we engage? And of course, that model's moving to mobile. But really where the money will be made, my, my, my view in the future is really how you connect systems of insight back to those systems of record. So, Data's, data's interesting and data's hugely valuable, but unless you can do something with it to inform a business process in real time, it's really not that interesting. So, so those existing uh, systems of record become hugely valuable in terms of connection points to the insights So you see some balance, some, some natural yep. segmentation that's somewhat healthy in the sense of big data and developer communities need to have a playground well, you or know sandbox. What's interesting is, is you, you're bringing up an early, I think an excellent point is bringing, David Floyer's talked about this a lot, bringing the transaction systems and the analytic systems together. And last week, we can't say who it was, but you know who I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I was really in the conversation. High profile <laughs> finance customer. And he drew a picture for us. He's, he, he bought a bunch of those new Z systems, sight unseen, and he drew the picture. I'm going to have that feeding through an InfiniBand into my Exadata. So, <laughs> that was right, right. bingo. Yeah. So and, and what did it do for him? Saved him huge cost. I mean, the whole value proposition was an order of magnitude well, significant. And, and I mean, it's like, it wasn't even like a debate. things like batch windows too, so you can you know, open at the market. Um, I want to ask you, uh, 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 from a customer perspective, when you think about, I think you call them integrated systems? Right, okay, when you think about integrated systems, why wouldn't or why don't customers do integrated systems? Are they afraid of, of lock-in? Is the channel sort of pushing a different choice on them? What do you see as the headwinds? I mean, the, the, big, the, the two biggest uh, challenges for in integrated systems are, uh, there's still a lot of people that question the cost, you know, because they, they do tend to be capex intensive systems, but they, they, the, the obvious benefit is they drive down overall spend and they, dri they drive down operational cost. Uh, that's, that's number one. I think the, big, the, the, most, the most challenging um, issue with these is, is the disruption they have to the marketplace in terms of um, the silo. So there are lots of organizational changes that need to be make in, made in most companies to really absorb these smoothly because the decision makers are different. And so you get into conversations. What I tend to see, particularly when you get into the infrastructure layer, is 
highly virtualized, highly dynamic companies, companies that have high rates of change in the business, they tend to get it. They, they recognize that I spent the last five or six years virtualizing, I want to move to more, more of a cloud-like model, and the way to get there is on an integrated platform. They're f they almost can't help themselves. Their first, their first wave of this, they're kicking the tires and they're playing around with all kinds of configs. And, they, and they, whoever their supplier is of choice, they're asking for all kinds of different analysis on different configs. Once they've gone through that once and they, and they understand the benefits, then they, they go much faster the second, third, fourth time. It's funny, isn't it, even though OpEx, and you guys have quantified this, the, the two-thirds of the cost in IT is, is labor, <coughs> but, but people don't see that as a hard dollar savings because they got people and it's, a, it's essentially a sunk cost. What am I going to do? Am I going to retrain them? Am I, I going to lay them off? I don't lose that. So that's, it's kind of a myopic you know, view, but it's a real view, isn't it's, it? It's real. I mean, we see it, and we've talked about this, this Dave, in the past where you have um, things like you know Moore's Law, which means the cost of computing drops in half every two years, but then you have that offset with uh, data doubling every 18 to 24 months and applications doubling roughly every four years. And, and the, the net effect is that about every eight years, the operational costs in a data center double. And, and so they're, they've been so focused on the, on the capex that it's really a, a penny-wise, pound-foolish type of an argument where they're, they're, they're so focused on what they're spending out the door, they're not recognizing truly what's happening inside. And most IT organizations will readily admit they don't have enough people, but their people are in the wrong place. So it's about 80% uh, of, their, of their overall investment going into keeping the lights on. What they do tend to tell us in their, in their journey to engineered systems is that they're expecting about a 25% reduction in OPEX as a result, and they want to put that OPEX savings into innovation, and they want to innovate in new applications, new workloads, new areas of innovation as they build these digital enterprises. What about the uh, hyper-converged guys? I flew at the late flight out on Monday. Doran Kempel was actually their CEO of SimpliVity. I think of those guys. I think of the folks like Nutanix. Where do they fit in this whole matrix? Well, they're certainly um, changing the conversation, and I think uh, part of what's, the one way I like to look at it is you have, uh, companies like VMware even changing their approach with Evo at last year with um, to be re somewhat responsive to the world of the hyperconverged players. They started with a you know two U appliance and that they indicated they're going to go full rack. Then you had the Microsoft uh, cloud platform system, which was with Dell. Um, that was a, also in some re regards a, a reaction, but what's happening is inside these systems is architecturally they're being built in a way that's much lower cost than the infrastructures that they're knocking out. So um, in both cases you're talking about you know, basically JBODs inside, inside the systems and so um, that's where you start to have some pretty interesting architectural implications for what the infrastructure looks like and if you line that up with Intel's roadmap, their, their kind of rack scale uh, thinking, where you can start to disaggregate a system down into trays of compute, memory, storage, I.O., and wrap some software around it. The next phase of this is really all about um, capturing the right layers of the software stack to represent those disaggregated layers back to the application, that software-defined world. And so you'll see, that's where I think a lot of the M&A activity will start to begin. Last week, um, uh, Citrix bought uh, 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 Symbolic. Sam Symbolic. Really so interesting a, acquisition. Yeah, kind of a component right. of, of a strategy, like how do you how do you think of across compute, network, and storage inside that? Well, so it gives so them a play in hyperconverged right. now exactly. with, with the Evo Rail, an answer exactly. to the Evo Rail. Exactly. Right. So yeah. is that to fill in the blanks on integrated on their integrated uh, strategy opportunities? I mean, because we're seeing like, you know, we're seeing Dells, we're seeing HP, <coughs> we're seeing IBM, all the old school dudes kind of retooling, right? So, <laughs> so the Dell guys are going to HP, HP guys are going to Dell, we're seeing some movement, people changing sure. their jerseys, but that comes down to the bottom line is, what do they have in the product closet? And if they don't have the tech, they got to either buy it or shift to say services. So are you seeing that other beachhead of services being a part of it? Because you can do some stuff with services like orchestration. Sure. So how are, is that, a, is that a function of them just giving up, saying I don't have the tech, so I'm going to go get some, some territory in that area? What's um, that whole services piece? How do you look at that landscape? I, I mean, I think uh, what I saw really happen in 2014 was a shift in the conversation that the vendor community and the analyst community was having with the, uh, with the user. If you think about all the, the underpinnings that we're talking about here today in terms of cloud and hyper-converged uh, and, and just integration in general, a lot of it's been really uh, led by the hyperscalers and the hype, like the Amazons and the Googles mm -hmm. and, and, and with the focus on, on really enabling this, this mobile ecosystem. So a lot of the workload that runs in these, hyper, these, these uh, hyperscale environments is really kind of a mobile consumer workload. The next phase is really how do you get the enterprise on board? And when you start to think that way, it becomes 
you have to start to change the thinking in the enterprise. The enterprise has really thought a lot about how do you digitize specific business processes, but now we're talking about end-to-end -end digital enablement of a business. And so what started to change last year was, was you know, really giving, not, not only giving the customers permission, but really giving them some sort of a, a sense of urgency that they need to start to think this way, that any industry is potentially disrupted with technology. So you have lots of you know, industry leaders like John Chambers will say that every company becomes a, a technology-based uh, organization or they'll fail. And, and so that, that type of thinking is really starting to pervade the enterprise. And with the economy getting a bit better, you're, you're starting to see people take a bit more long-term long view. What we saw right after the recession in, in 2009, 2010 was a lot of reactive spending, but now it's becoming a bit more uh, visionary kind of outlook spending. In the data center we were on earlier with uh, the, the product engineering man and senior director, and, and he, he nailed it, which is the data center is now inside out. Okay, so, so in, 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 in the security models and in everything else, if that's happening, obviously, it has to be shored up. The enterprises have to get there, they have to rein it in. So there's an opportunity to, to slay the legacy. I mean, the difference between the hyperscalers is they have a clean sheet of paper. So mobile's a layup, right? Not a layup, but compared to an enterprise. Right, right. You've got or systems of record you mentioned earlier. This is baggage in a, in a, in a, in a, from a momentum standpoint. And, and I think you'll see organizationally, so whether it still takes hardware, software, and services to, to fulfill the need, but organizationally what you'll start to see people do is focus on what we would call third platform or next gen opportunity, next ten, gen digital digital enterprise opportunity versus more traditional. The more traditional is always going to be very focused on how do you help the customer save money and, and how do you help them essentially reduce costs. And what you want to do is help them shift that, what they're saving, into new areas and new areas of spend. And how do you enable some of these next generation workloads and applications to be brought online? So I got to ask you about the, the, the three letter uh, company, VCE. Obviously this, this is a lot of VCE-like stuff. It's kind of dancing around. They, they're not coming out and saying VCE, but we've heard um, sure. you know, companies say you know, that it's basically built their own V-block. Okay, so that's going on right now in the, in the industry. V, you know, I was actually skeptical on VCE when it first came out. I'm like, ah, partnerships really don't work, and you know, it was a, you know, big whales kind of dancing together. It actually it worked significantly well. Is this a VCE alternative? This announcement is at the beginning of that kind of offering? Well, I think um, you, you probably see two things happen. One, VCE for an EMC will become you know, kind of their integrated uh, brand, and there'll be uh, lots of different technologies inside of that. So they'll continue to expand uh, you know, beyond VBlock, and there'll be other types of, of VBlock offerings with other technology partners. What um, Oracle's done is they've, of course, they've, they've looked at the data center, they've looked at their, their own software assets, and they've looked at what types of stacks can be optimized, and whether it's a, a, a kind of a pure application, if you will, or, or some sort of middleware stack, or even some sort of a, a, you know, something that happens on the back end, like, like a backup and, and recovery type appliances. So they're looking at all the things that you do in the data center and then trying to make that very, very easy to deploy. What they have to do is, is look for ways to make that attractive, not just to enterprise, but also to uh, service providers. Not, and I don't mean Google or Amazon, I mean the, the massive number of service providers that are yeah. in this world that MSPs and hosters and, and folks So what like about that. Cisco, what do they have? If EMC gets VCE and Oracle has their Oracle, Engineer Systems, what does Cisco have? Well, Cisco, UCS? I mean, Cisco, if you look at the two, so maybe tell, tell the story this way, to, maybe it's a good way to kind of sum this all up. If you look at the integrated systems landscape and you look at traditional storage and traditional server, there are only two vendors on the planet that actually are pulling more share in integrated than they have in general purpose, Oracle and Cisco. Cisco uh, has a significantly more share in compute in integrated than they have in the overall compute market where they're five, six percent. They're running close to 40 percent in integrated. And Oracle, when you look at integrated platforms, has a significantly uh, higher share of compute and storage uh, value in that, in that platform's market than they have a general purpose compute and storage. So they're both, I think, working this shift in the market to their advantage, but they're not necessarily competing head to head because Cisco is really going after that infrastructure layer and Oracle, more general purpose layer, and, and Oracle's been looking at that high value, high performance application yeah. layer. There's enough territory where they don't have to actually bump chests yet, right. but I mean, a networking vendor, I mean, Oracle would look at Cisco and say, oh, they're a networking vendor, <laughs> they're a database vendor, it's kind of wink, wink, but okay, that's they have huge install bases that they're building off, so that's their core strategy to leverage their install base, right? right? Versus vis a vis the other guys. So, what do you think of the, the parameters for victory here or, or, or sustained success? So, when, I think what I would say to, to Oracle and to Oracle's customers, even, is Oracle built a, a very successful business 
um, they did that um, you know, on their own with their, a lot of their own engineering and innovation, but they also did it with partners. And so if I think about Oracle, I, I, you know, Oracle's got a, a, a full suite of solutions. We're going to hear more about that today in the engineered systems uh, arena. But they also need to think about ways to take their, their software assets and monetize them through other uh, uh, hardware partners. So you could start to see, I mean, we saw Oracle and, and Dell get a little bit closer last year. You could start to see mm -hmm. Oracle doing some, some interesting things with, with other ecosystem partners, particularly in that infrastructure layer. Selectively. Yeah, selectively. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where, where, where it makes sense for both, both parties. Yeah. Well, the final horses on the track analysis is, is there a dark horse in all, in all this out there that you see that is not on everyone's narrative? Is there someone, is there a story of John Fallis, when, someone's, when everyone's done inventing, there'll be new inventions. Is there a market shift, inflection, shift winds that are changing that you might see, say, hey, we're watching that dark horse over there or that dark market segment? I would say competitively, the, probably the two biggest things happening in the market today that uh, potentially have impact here is the development of, of China as an ecosystem of technology players. So uh, China as a market has grown to be the second largest um, IT market. And it's they're trying very hard to build their own um, uh, ecosystem of players, Lenovo, Huawei, et cetera. Um, so that's, I think that's one area to, um, to certainly keep a very, very close eye on. Um, and then it could be disrupted just on the numbers itself, just on pure net dollars. Right, exactly. Never mind the other things. And then open in general, when you think about cloud and third platform, a lot of what's happening is, is the, the shift in, in, into more and more open source technologies. And you know, that's not necessarily new. It's something that the, the, the vendor community has been dealing with for the last 15 years or more. But you have to think about ways to, to build new forms of value on top of that, uh, to really leverage that open ecosystem. And, and of course, the, 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 the customer wants that and, and the vendor needs to figure out ways to live in that, in that world. And we are here live in Silicon Valley with Group Vice President of IDC, Matt Eastwood, industry analyst. Uh, great to have you. Um, I'll give you the final word. Share with the folks out there uh, in the audience um, about this announcement. What is the bottom line here? What is Oracle doing? What's the big, the big um, the, the secret, uh, secret sauce here for this announcement? What's the, what's the meat on the bone? So I think the, you know, really what today is all about is, is reminding the marketplace, reminding customers of how far Oracle's come in the last five years since they acquired Sun. And, and, and of course, engineered systems would even go back a click or two before that with, um, with HP. But their, their, um, their, their portfolio has, has really become quite significant and there'll be new additions to that portfolio today. So they're looking at ways to really operationalize and create new efficiencies in a data center um, by thinking very about very specific workloads and very specific use cases in the data center and creating a new model for deployment there. It fits well for customers that are trying to make that transition from second to third platform that are looking to become much more efficient in the traditional world while creating investment for some of these new uh, deeply uh, mobile oriented analytic applications that are coming to market. That's awesome. I mean, for me, I think this is about the sun. I mean, I 100% agree with you, but this is about sun flexing their muscles. I think it's a proud moment for, look at, we did it, it's happening. The tree is, in, is growing, there's fruit coming off the tree. I think there's an underlying tone of, hey, sun's back inside Oracle and working. Dave, your thoughts on th what this announcement is? Oh yeah, means? I mean, I think it's, um, it's all about getting fruit from the tree, as you said, the R&D investment's paying off and, and delivering a portfolio of, of products that can actually drive business. All right, guys, thanks so much. Top industry analysts here in Oracle's headquarters for the big announcement. Larry Ellis is coming up at one o'clock. Stay tuned. This is theCUBE with more interviews. We'll be right back after this short break. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. This is theCUBE.